I only remember two incidents on the trip from Waterloo to Laverne, Minnesota. We were transferring from one train to another. Mother was in her tight-waisted, long, gray coat and wearing a big, wide hat with a feather, holding Irene three months, wrapped in a shawl and her long, white baby dress, which is not used anymore, in her arms. She carried a big black bag full of diapers and other baby clothes over her arm. Burl, too, in a white dress reaching to the top of his tiny black slippers, his head a mass of long blonde curls held on to mother's coat. Marshall, four, and I followed close on her heels to make sure we did not get separated. I was carrying another bag of spare clothing while between us we half carried and dragged an oblong stiff canvas port manteau filled with loaves of cut homemade bread spread with butter and apple jam, ginger cookies, apples, a small bag of dry oatmeal, tea, tin cups, spoons, a fruit cake, and a cake of maple sugar. All for our food for the trip. I don't remember where the pot to cook the oatmeal was. But I remember she cooked the oatmeal and made the tea on the cook stove supplied in the coach. We ate our porridge in the tin cups. Then mother washed them out and we used them for our tea. To a little boy who had been used to an outside privy or a bedroom pot, the prospect of using a toilet on a moving train all by himself was an exciting prospect. We were no sooner on the train and settled in our seats than I found an excuse to visit this wonder. Mother was busy feeding Irene from her breast, so she gave me permission to go by myself. I walked up the swaying aisle, grabbing hold of the arms of the seats to keep from falling. I opened the door and stepped inside. I closed the door after me and after fumbled around with all the things around the doorknob, I got the door so it wouldn't swing open. Then I noticed the big looking glass. I made a few faces at it. Nothing happened. The sink then caught my attention. It was empty. I looked at my hands. They were dirty. I couldn't find a pail of water nor a dipper, but I could hear the water splashing in the tank beside the sink. 
Then I started monkeying with the tap. I'd never seen a thing like this before, but from its shape, it looked like the spigot at the bottom of Gramper's cider barrel. Twisting and turning on it, I finally got water to come out. But the water ran out as fast as it ran in. I used quite a bit of water before I finally found the way to keep the water in the sink. I washed my hands and face and wiped on the big roller towel. It was not very clean and I didn't help it any by wiping my still dirty hands on it. There was no soap. Next, I discovered the toilet bowl and I suddenly realized why I was in the toilet. I raised the seat cover. There was a big hole. I could see the ground and the wheels turning very fast. This was the place. I found that by moving to the side of the toilet, I could squirt right into the turning wheels. This was fun. By now, the water stopped coming. I was through. Oh well. I would know what to do when I wanted to pee again. I better hurry. Mother would worry if I was gone too long. I carefully closed the flap over the little hole of my pants, then turned the doorknob, but the door would not open. No matter which way I turned the knob or tried to move the other things on the door, it would not open. I pounded on the door and kicked and yelled as loud as I could. No one answered. The train made so much noise, nobody could hear me. I had to get out some way. I pulled on the bars across the window. They were too strong. I couldn't move them. Iron bars. Jails had iron bars and nobody could get out of jails. Next, I thought of the hole in the bottom of the toilet. I could get out that way, but when I raised the seat cover again, the hole was so small, I could not squeeze through. There was no way to get out. No one could get the door open. I was going to die here. Mother would have to go to our new home without me. I would not be there to help with all the bags and grips. She would have to leave all she could not carry on the train. Then there would be no food or clothes for the rest. I wondered how many days it would be before someone broke the door down. I was hungry and there was no food. Without food, I would die soon. Mother told me that Uncle Frank had went to sleep and died. No one could get me out, so I would die. I was down on my knees, clearing the dirty paper away so I could clean a place to lie down and go to sleep and die when I heard a noise at the door. The conductor opened the door and stepped inside and said, 
You'd better get back to your mother. You can't play in here. I jumped up, ducked between his legs and the others who were waiting to get in and ran to mother. She wiped my tear-streaked, dirty face and made a place for her, for me beside her. I was still scared. I would never go back in there again. We were on the train a long time and nature called again. There was no other place to go so I had to go back in again. But this time I took my shoe off and wedged it into the door so I would not be stuck in there again. I learned a lesson I have never forgot. Never lock a door or close a lock before knowing you have the key to unlock it again. When father left Waterloo, he rented a quarter section of land near Egerton, Pipestone County, in the southwestern part of Minnesota. It was fairly level land, bare of trees, except for the few trees that were planted around the buildings for some wind protection. The winters were cold and the wind seemed never to stop blowing hard. Everyone wore oilskins over their winter clothes to stop if they were going to be out in the wind. As without the oilskins, furs did not give much warmth. It did not rain often during the summer, but when it did, it came down in bucketfuls for a few minutes, then stopped, flowing away into pools instead of soaking into the ground where it fell. Corn was the main crop. It had to be picked by hand, then put into large lathe lattice corn cribs for storage until sold or fed out. All feeding was from the cob. Even the horses could strip cobs in nothing flat. Ross and Minnie Taylor were our first neighbors after moving to the States. Our relations were very close in our two families. They had two children then, Helen, about Earl's age, and Millard, Jim, about Irene's age. It has always been Uncle Ross and Aunt Millie and Aunt Hattie and Uncle Josie among us children. They were closer and more family together than our own uncles and aunts. They moved to Alberta with us and we homesteaded together. Even though miles have separated us in later years, we have not lost touch with one another. We shared our hardships and our fun. And we have many, many pleasant times together to remember. Moving to the States changed the complexion of our home life. The arguing between mother and dad stopped. Dad had more time for us kids. The house was big and us boys didn't have to all sleep in one bed. The kids spoke English instead of French. 
There was no religion bug to keep the neighbors apart, and there was time for visiting back and forth. There was more to eat and more variety. We could eat as much as we wanted to and no more. You've had enough. Leave some for the others. Or, that's all there is. Our clothes were always clean and respectable, though they were all hand-me-downs. Now we got new things, or at least clothes made from cloth that was not worn thin by someone else. Mother was a good seamstress, so what she made fitted us. We learned to look after our clothes better and keep them nice. Rats were a real nuisance in Minnesota. They were everywhere and spoiled a lot of grain. One of my jobs was to use a stick to keep the rats out of the feed boxes when the horses were eating their grain. The rats would bite the horse's nose to make them raise their heads out of their feed box. Then they would jump in and eat the fresh grain until they were full, and then pee on the rest of it. Then the horses would not eat it. I used to sit on the top rail between the two stalls and keep the rats away with a long stick. The horses didn't mind me up there switching the rats. In fact, I think they kind of enjoyed it. It was certainly better than having their noses bitten. Every so often, Dad would close off all the holes on the bottom of the corn crib except one. He would put us kids into the crib with tin cans to make a noise so the rats would run out through the hole. He had left while he stood there with a club to kill them as we scared them out. Then he would load the dead ones into the wheelbarrow and dump them on the manure pile. Four or five loads each time. I remember one morning, Dad went to the corn crib for a pail of corn. A rat bit his finger when he got careless in picking up the ears. It brought blood, in it, and he was really mad when he came to the house for a bandage. I was eating a, pole, a bowl of Johnny cake and milk. He told it to leave it and come with him. He had had enough of those rats and was going to clean them out. He boarded up all the holes around the corn crib, except one. He told me to get in the crib and jump around on the corn to scare the rats out. He waited with the dog at the open hole with a big stick. He had built a board fence about two feet high and three feet long square space at the edge of the open hole. The idea being, if he missed the rat, then it would come out of the hole and he could get it before it got away. Fine. When he and the dog were in the box and he got his club ready, he hollered for me to jump in. I did. Out came the rats as fast as they could squeeze through the hole. There were dozens of them. Scared and trying to get away, they bit the dog. 
he jumped out, leaving Dad alone in the midst of the milling bunch of rats. They didn't know enough to go back where they came from. Guess maybe they couldn't get back because more rats kept coming through the hole. I kept jumping as dad had told me to do, and the rats kept coming. He swung his club with all his might, but the melee only increased. He had not expected the outrush and onrush and was stunned into silence. It took a few minutes before he realized the situation. Then he hollered for me to stop jumping. As he hollered me to a rat, trying to find a way to freedom, ran up his pant leg. He dropped his club, grabbed his leg, and jumped over the fence, out of the way of the rampaging rats. I could see what was going on through the slats of the crib. Dad was holding on to his pant leg with both hands squeezing with all his might. His face was white. He didn't look good. I got out of the crib and ran to him as fast as I could. As I went around the fence space, I glanced inside. The rats that could still move were making a hurried exit back through the hole into the corn crib. Seeing me, Dad stood up and gingerly let go of his pant leg. A hardly recognizable squashed rat slid slowly to the ground. He stepped away. He cautioned me never to mention the squashed rat to anyone. I didn't and never realized what it was like to have something run up your pant leg until years later when I was working the night shift at Brooks. It was quiet. Not a soul around. I pulled out the bottom drawer of the desk to raise my feet a little then leaned back in my swivel chair to enjoy a good mystery story. I had just reached the part where the murderer had climbed through a window in the basement of the darkened house. Feeling his way through a window in the stairs leading to the bedroom. He climbed the stairs, making no sound. He slowly turned the knob of one of the bedrooms and slowly opened the door. Suddenly, he dropped to his knees and slowly felt his way to the bed. I had a sensation that something was crawling up my pant leg. I dropped my book and slapped the sensation spot as hard as I could with an open hand. I jumped from my chair and thoroughly, and a thoroughly crushed mouse dropped out of my pant leg onto the floor. I'm not afraid of mice, but that one left me with no desire to read any more that night. Mother and dad had taught me 
to read and write, and by numbers, and how to add and subtract. They knew how to teach and make me understand the fundamentals, which started me off in the right direction when it finally came time to start my education in the little wood schoolhouse a couple of miles from where I lived. I only stayed in the baby class long enough for the teacher to find out what class she would put me in. The work she gave me came easy, so I would hurry through it, then listen to what was going on in the higher classes. This is the way I worked it all through my schooling. Maybe that's why I got through my schooling so easy. I never made good marks in grammar, just enough to get by. I hated that subject. It was the only one I ever had to study for an examination. Even though my marks were low in it, they were well above the average in all the other subjects because I liked them and retained them in my memory. Which is more than I can say about people's names. Anyway, I was well up above my age group in all the subjects when I left the little school and came to Alberta. I started going to school the first spring we were in the States. We lived in a German settlement. Most of the parents spoke only German, but the children were taught in English. Georgie Cole was my age and lived a half a mile closer to school than I. The next two miles away seemed shorter when we were together. His mother spoke broken English and was always happy. Every night, she met Georgie and I at the road with a cookie for each of us. Sometimes I stopped to play with him on the way home and we would do the same at my home. Being the youngest and smallest of the 35 kids at the school, we not only had to sit in the front row, but had to hear the brunt of the older kids jokes and tomfoolery. So for our own sake, we stuck close together. But that didn't mean we didn't take part in the things we shouldn't do. We soon learned tattling didn't get us anywhere. Most times we came out on the short end. We got blamed for a lot of things we didn't do just because of where we sat and being too small to assert ourselves. There was a well-worn path between our seats and the high chair in the corner where we had to sit with a dunce hat on. Our knuckles and shoulders received more than our share of clips by the teacher's long pointer for things we hadn't done. I got a spanking for breaking a window in a game of anti-I-over. I wasn't even playing. Shucks. I couldn't even throw the ball over the school roof, and the kids 
wouldn't let you play unless you could do that. Then Georgie got a spanking for putting a live mouse in the teacher's table drawer. He didn't do it, but the other kids said he did. So after the mouse was chased outside and the teacher got down off the table and quit screaming, she pulled down his pants and really laid it on. We got some revenge, or at least we thought we did, from Georgie's strong marble shooting thumb. He could hit any letter written on the blackboard with a spitball at 10 feet, which was the distance from our seat to the board. I made the spitballs and he shot them. We learned the wetter the spitball, the bigger the mess they made, and they stuck better where they hit, too. The hard ones hurt and caused more commotion. We always had a hard one ready. If there was a chance when the teacher had her head turned to write on the board. George's favorite target was a spot just above the base of her collar at the base of her high coiled hair. He was accurate and crafty and never got caught. We were darlings with head down and studying. That's when other kids got the blame and punishment. The kids were as mystified as the teacher. They didn't suspect either of us. I couldn't shoot marbles for sour beans and Georgie intentionally only shot good enough to hold his own when playing in a game. It was much more fun shooting spitballs. The teacher was a big woman, as big around as she was tall. With the strength of an ox and the temper of a wet hen. The only time she ever smiled was when she was giving a kid a lickin'. She was an old maid and had red hair. Perhaps why I never liked red hair. She was the butt of the kids' jokes, and they were always picking on her, much to the amusement of all when some stunt clicked. I remember the lunch hour was just about over. We were playing Pum Pum Pull Away. The teacher came out of the school and went into the girls' toilet. One of the boys slipped over and turned the button on the door, knowing that with her strength, she could easily push the button off and get out. A bunch of the kids grabbed sticks and boards and placed them against the door. Then they went back to their game. Nothing happened, so we all went back in the school got out our slates and started to study. Time went on. Still nothing happened. Everyone got nervous, then scared. We couldn't stand the strain, so it was decided that someone had to go and let her out. Finally, the biggest and oldest girl in the school 
who had been one of the ringleaders at the start, went out and opened the door. The teacher came in and sat down at her desk as though nothing had happened. She never said a word. Her face was white as a sheet and somehow her hair seemed to be on fire. We all knew she was awful mad. Every kid was on his best behavior and studied extra hard for the balance of the afternoon. It came time for the last bell and we were extra anxious to get out and away. Instead of the bell, we heard the teacher calling out the names of five of the older kids, three boys, two girls, to come to her desk. White and trembling with fury, she told us she had heard the button turn on the toilet door and she knew she was locked in. She had watched through the small thumb latch hole and had seen all that had taken place to block the door and who had been the culprits. She would not punish the girl who had let her out, but instead would talk to her family. The others would get the beating of their lives. She challenged anyone who thought she couldn't do it. The rest of us sat trembling in our seats, feeling every blow as one after the other. She made them bend over the table and she rained blow after blow across their bottoms with that big five foot pointer. There were a lot of tears, but everything was still as we wended our way home. Watching the kids who had taken the punishment the day before, standing beside their seats to study because there was too much pain to sit down, had a sobering effect on the rest of us kids. The teacher's mood had not changed from yesterday. Our schoolwork received extra attention, anything to keep away from her wrath. Though the work in the schoolroom improved, the atmosphere outside deteriorated rapidly. Rather than play games, small and then larger groups gathered together to plan for retaliation for the severe beatings we received. Not for the punishment. All were agreed that they should receive punishment for the wrong they had done, but rather the severity of the punishment and fear of what would happen to the other children if she had occasion to punish again. Each punishment had gradually become more severe. Yesterday, in a fit of madness and with her great strength, she had beaten to numbness without thought of the after effect. The punishment for anything done against her had to be considered. At the time, I did not realize the importance of the action or its effects. It was all excitement and adventure and a realization that I was being at least considered by an older and more grown up bunch of kids, which made me feel pretty good. It was not until I was much older and had to make plans for myself or with others 
that I fully realized the amount of clear thinking and good planning that went into the retaliation venture. The next day, everyone was present and worked hard to get their work right. But outside, during noon and the two recess periods, instead of playing games, all the girls went out for sport. The sport of killing snakes. The school was on a small hill. It was fully enclosed by two strands of barbed wire. The only outlet was a large steel gate that swung out to the road and was held shut by a large hook. Why all this detail? You'll see. It's the best part. What was the reason for so many of those little two to three foot long harmless snakes being on that hill remains a mystery to me. Maybe because of the many stones and and holes on the hill. On a hot day, the snakes hovered against the stones for added warmth. And this day was hot. The snakes were easy to kill. Worrying a snake in a hole with a stick brought the snake out. As he left the hole, you grabbed his tail and with a quick snap, it broke its neck. The ones around the rocks we caught and held with a board until we could get hold of its tail. Then snap, and it was all over. Georgie and I, being so young and small, were not given any of the plans, but were sworn to secrecy along with the others also for the same reason. Once there were a few snakes ahead, we had to pick the dead ones up and string them over the wire between the fence posts. When we got the fence filled on the side of the school where there were no windows and the end away from the door, we piled the rest in twos and threes between the posts under the fence on the other two sides. The teacher always stayed late to put the new work on the board. When the last bell went, all but three girls from one class went outside. The three girls stayed in to get some help with their schoolwork and at the same time keep the teacher inside where she would not see what was going on around the yard. The rest of the small kids and us two were not to stay around but go home. We did without arguing. The older boy hung the balance of the snakes over the fence and gate so that every space in the whole fence was blocked by snakes. As soon as they were finished, all but two of the boys hurried away home. The two boys waited outside the door until the girls came out and got through the gate. Then they finished their job by leaving two snakes stretched along the doorstep, closed the gate, and wound two snakes around the big gate hook. Everyone had left the school some time before the teacher decided to call it a day and go home. 
she was terrified of snakes. Shortly before midnight, she landed at our place and mother got me up for her questioning. She told us that when she opened the door and saw the snakes lying there so close, she was so scared she had fainted. Finally, she came to and used the long pointer to push the snakes far away so she could get out. Using the pointer, she tried the gate without success. When she tried the fence, the snakes fell on the ground and made it worse for her. Nearing darkness and afraid snakes would be crawling about in the dark, she managed to poke the snakes at the door away and went back inside to spend the night. But hoping someone would come past and let her out. The road was seldom used, but it also so happened that a fellow going home from town took that road that night. It was fairly dark, but he saw her waving and calling for help. He had quite a job getting the gate opened. He was sympathetic to her story and mad over what the kids had done. He had only heard her side of the story. He had driven her around to the homes of some of the kids, but they wouldn't talk or denied any knowledge of what had happened. She had come to our place thinking because I was little, she could scare me into giving her the names of the culprits that had caused her such a dreadful evening. She didn't get anything out of me because I didn't know what the scheme was until the next day. Sure, I knew who killed the snakes and put them on the fence, but we only put snakes on two sides. We didn't do the other two sides and I didn't know anything about it. I wouldn't tattle on any of them. We were a well subdued and scared bunch as we gathered outside the schoolyard gate, waiting for the first bell to ring. Under the guidance of the older kids, we remained calm. We filed in all together and took our seats. The teacher was pacing back and forth behind her table with her long pointer in her hand. The school always opened with the singing of the Star Spangled Banner, but there was no opening song that morning. The teacher started in by telling us what she thought of us. Then her opinion of her parents, who would raise the kids, the kind of kids we were. She was going to punish every kid until they told her everything they knew about what had happened. And when she found the ringleaders, she would thrash them to within an inch of their lives. She ordered each to line up and take their punishment. Everyone stood beside their seats. Then one of the oldest boys led the way with the older girls and boys following. The teacher stood poised, ready to strike. She looked like a giant to me. The first boy moved her chair out of the way. As he did so, he dropped a small coiled snake on it and then bent over the table 
and waited. As she went past the chair, she noticed the snake. Throwing her arms in the air, she screamed, drop pointer, and backed into the corner as far away as she could get and begged for the snake to be taken away. Then I noticed that all the older boys were holding a snake at their back. The teacher too noticed this when she looked for help from the children. The lad on the table stood up and took the snake from the chair. Holding it in front of him, he told her that the children had promised to behave, study, and not play any more tricks if she would promise not to hit one of them with the pointer. She was ready to promise anything if those snakes were taken away. To make sure she kept her promise, he told her one snake would be handy if she forgot. Also, if she used the pointer, the snakes would not be hung on the fence. They would be let loose alive in the schoolhouse. That finished the playing tricks on one another. The teacher changed completely and tried to be extra nice. She would not stay in the school unless some of the older girls stayed with her and left with the rest of the kids. She quit a short time later and most of the kids were sorry to have her go. She had changed so much. A man replaced her. He was a good teacher and we learned a lot from him. We all liked him and were soon enjoying all the fun of going to school. When I see a fat, roly-poly woman I am often reminded of that teacher sitting in mother's large rocking chair that night she came to our house about me and the funny sight when she got up to go. The chair came up with her and mother bracing her feet to get the chair loose from her fat bottom. Teachers were given complete leeway in those days as to how they punished their pupils. Some were pretty severe. The parents did not interfere. In fact, in most cases, if a kid got punished in school and the parents found out, as he usually got a much worse punishment from his parents, Therefore, it was wiser not to say anything when he got home. In this particular case, had the parents found out what was going on, I think they would have banded together and ran her out of the country because no one would have stood by and watched an animal being beaten as the children were. Today, she would have been sent to the bug house for treatment.